So money is a form of government debt. Uh, why do you buy government debt at all? Uh, well, because you think you're going to get paid back. Uh, so government debt uh, is an asset that's valuable because it's a claim on the future taxes that the government is going to uh, raise in order to pay off that debt. Uh, if the government doesn't raise future taxes to pay off the debt, like for example the government of Greece who seems to have discovered is, is unable to do, then the government debt becomes worth less. And money is just a, a form of very short-term government debt. Uh, the, the money that really counts these days are bank reserves. Uh, cash is, is very old-fashioned. Almost all cash is $100 bills with traces of cocaine on it living under, under mattresses in Russia. Uh, what counts is, is, is electronic money, and that, that is uh, overnight floating rate government debt that is very liquid used by banks to settle transactions. That's kind of the big picture view. Can, can I take another 30 seconds here? Please, please. If you want to understand where inflation comes from eventually, we, we have this faith that, oh, Ben Bernanke's got his hands on the lever, and, and it's all the Federal Reserve that, that runs inflation. And this body of literature that Gideon was referring to, um, starting with, well, most recently, Tom Sargent in the 1980s, has pointed that fiscal affairs are at least uh, centrally important, if not, in the extreme, the, the main thing causing inflation. And to understand that, um, imagine that Greece comes to the US. Imagine, which could happen, a moment comes that the bond markets look at the US and say, you know what, these jokers aren't going to pay that stuff off. Now, every year the US government has to not just borrow money to fund that year's deficits, they have to borrow money to pay off the old investors. We roll over short-term debt all the time. Well, if the bond markets say, you know, that's not happening, this debt is not worthwhile, we get a debt crisis, just like Greece has had. And then we have very few choices. One choice is we could default. I, I think our government will choose not to do that. The other choice is we print up money to, uh, to roll over the debt. The new debt comes in, uh, the Fed chooses to print up the money to pay off the old bondholders, and, and that you can all pretty clearly see leads to inflation. So it is to some extent a choice, and we can talk about it's a choice, but I think you can see what's going to happen in our economy. If there's trillions of dollars worth of debt that the, that the Treasury is unable to roll over, uh, as the ECB is printing up euros to, to roll over the uh, sovereign debt of the, of the southern tier, I think it's pretty clear that's what our government will do. And now you see the link. If you, if you run out of uh, fiscal ability, if you run out of ability to raise current taxes, cut current spending, persuade the bondholders that you're going to be able to raise taxes in the future, if you run out of the ability to make that government debt worthwhile and you don't want to default on the government debt, you got to print up money to pay it off. And there's just no way out. That's accounting, and that's, that's the central mechanism by which a fiscal crisis is likely to turn into inflation, especially in a country like ours where we, we have our own currency, we can print money to pay off debt, and, and it's a pretty good bet we're likely to do so. How'd I do? I want to uh, maybe now throw in uh, <laughs> a grain of salt here. Um, th th this, this particular perspective is a, is a new but somewhat uh, still unorthodox perspective, and there's a bit of a you know, battle in the, in the science going on on this. Um, the, the maybe orthodox perspective, but you know, it's, it's under debate too, is, is, is what Milton Friedman has introduced, right? Thinking of money as a, as a means of uh, exchange. Money is valuable. You know, I, 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 I'm willing to accept the dollar in a trade because I expect that the next person is willing to accept that dollar in a trade. There's never really a dividend. It's just that the green, uh, that the greenback is just passed on from, from one person to the next. And that gives it, it gives its value. So Milton Friedman has famously said, inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon. And what he meant by that is that if the central bank, the central bank controls the, the, the growth rate of, of the money stock and thereby controls the inflation rate. And you know, if you look across many countries, that's by and large true. If you look at the hyperinflations in Russia and Germany and so forth, these are countries that had an enormous growth in the money stock. If you look at other countries that brought inflation down, it's often the central bank that brought the that brought the inflation rate down. So this is a new perspective, and it runs under the heading of the fiscal theory of the price level. And uh, you know there are really two perspectives here to take, <clears throat> and, and John sort of mixed these two. Should, so just to explain this a little bit. So one is it's it's just is is necessary from an asset price equation 
to say that the price level has to be tied down to the future, um, to the future surpluses that the government has. But I think the broader perspective, and I think that's what's, that's what's intriguing here about it, is that there are really two players here, right? There the, 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 there's the tax authorities, there's the fiscal players, and there's the central bank. And the central bank, you know, the, the more orthodox view is, could just stand back and just refuse to do anything about you know, what, the, what the government out there is doing. Right? The ECB could refuse to step in and help Greece, could refuse to step in and help Spain. You know, the, the central bank and the, the Federal Reserve Bank could uh, refuse to help uh, the, the United States with its fiscal trouble. And then, if there is outstanding debt, well, then there's no choice, but the government will have to default. And we saw defaults in Greece, right? So we, we have seen plenty of defaults on sovereign debt. The sovereign defaults do happen, right? And, and sovereign defaults can then happen, and that would leave the, the value of the money, would leave you know, the, the Big Mac price, it would leave that intact. But of course, the other possibility is that you don't allow the default to happen. You do something so as to you know, keep these bonds trading, as to avoid the default. And exactly which way to achieve that may be, may be an interesting debate among scientists. But I think at the bottom of it is you can take the other perspective and say, if the central bank always allows the fiscal player um, to, to, to run its course and to never allow a default, if the ECB and the, and the Federal Reserve Bank always do whatever is necessary so that a default does not occur, then of course it must be right that the fiscal deficits and the future fiscal surpluses ultimately determine inflation. But it's this tension between what a central bank does and what the fiscal player does that, that, that determines inflation. And I think that's where the modern perspective is set. It. So it's, it's neither quite the fiscal player nor the central bank. It depends on you know, which with, it, it depends on the strength that each player has in this, in this game to insist on, on its particular share of the pie. So give me just 30 seconds here. Because <laughs> I want to actually agree with Harold. Uh, but uh, Milton Friedman is famous for money, uh, inflation is always and everywhere, monetary phenomenon, MV equals PY. That was actually on his license plates, MV, PY. I, I remember seeing once a car in San Francisco with that license plate and a little man coming out and I knew I'd never seen Milton Friedman before, but I knew I'd seen him then, so wow. it's absolutely true. But Milton Friedman, actually, he, he was very clear that the Fed's ability to control money and therefore inflation rested on a fiscal foundation. This was only going to work so long as the government was solvent fiscally. Uh, he has some famous papers about joint fiscal and monetary interactions. Yes, the Fed can control the price level, only if the treasury is there and the treasury is solvent. If the treasury is not solvent, MV equals PY, well, the Fed's going to have to print up the M. Historically, or, or the too. Has to default. Or default, yeah, we'll get there. So. Historically, too, we see, oh, hyperinflation's too much money. Wait a minute. Why were they printing up too much money? In fact, every single hyperinflation comes from a fiscal crisis. The reason the governments were printing up too much money is because that was their last source of funding, government spending. They, could, they couldn't raise taxes. You look historically, in fact, and, and I'd go with inflation is always and everywhere a fiscal phenomenon because the reason the central banks were printing up money was to fund fiscal deficits, and the ends of the inflations did not come when the central banks just said, oh, wow, we've been dumb all these years. We'll stop printing money. It came, the German hyperinflation, when they solved the, the underlying fiscal problem and the Fed was able to stop printing money. But let me agree on default. The fiscal crisis, the crisis comes, your choice is inflate or default. And in fact, I'd like to see more default. I'm, I'm really a hard money guy. I would like to see no inflation. I'd like to see a price level target. And the only way that's going to happen is if we agree government debt will get defaulted on rather than printed, uh, that money will be printed to, to, to inflate it away. So that is the fundamental choice. And the fiscal theory business is conditioned on the idea that we live in an institution where it will always be inflated away and not defaulted on. And maybe the defaulted on is a better institution. Great. Um, well, we, you touched on a lot of things that I was going to ask, but uh, there's still some. <laughs> there's still some left. Oh, there's um, a lot more left, so don't bother. Oh, there's lots left. Yeah. Um, or you can just let us go. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Um, I was going to ask. Um, you talked a bit about policies. Um, value of money is determined to a large extent on what people expect to happen in the future. What the government is going to do. What are some sensible ways a government can manage these expectations to ensure that money is, is relatively stable over time? What are, and what are some things that have been tried in the past and how have they worked? Um, and what do, you, what do you think maybe should, should happen in the future? 
on the Harrow. Now this is an excellent question, and it it, it, has, it has so many facets. So let me let me start with one, which is uh, you know which we thought was just a Japanese problem, but now it's becoming a U.S. problem, maybe European problem. Has been a problem in Switzerland, which is deflation, right? So how do you get out of a deflationary trap? And and uh, well, maybe you should explain why is deflation bad? Right. So why is deflation bad? Well, def def a, m a modest degree of inflation is actually not that bad at all, right? Deflation. Because uh, deflation, right? So so that means if prices keep going down all the time, you know, slightly, right? If there's a slight decrease in prices, a gradual decrease in prices over time, you know, that's wonderful. You can put your money in your pocket. You, you know, you're not, you know, compare that for, compare that with a high inflation, right? If there's high inflation and you put money under your mattress and you take it out a year later, you know it's worth a lot less, right? In a, in a slightly deflationary regime, that's not so bad. You can put the money under your mattress, take it out a year later, and you actually earn interest on the money as it were, right? I mean, it doesn't matter whether you put it in your savings account on the cash. I th the, the fear about deflation is that, uh, you know, Deflation is sort of at the border of a of a cliff, right? So if the deflation becomes larger, then you know, then the degree of interest rates that would, would that would emerge in a in a in a stable economy, then people start you know looking to money as a as a key store of value. They they go into that. They they stop investing in in houses. They stop investing in companies. They start they start holding money. And they start, uh, they stop paying for goods and services, and you know that that could uh, derail the whole economy. And so, countries, you know, the, the experience so far always has been that if there has been deflation, you know, the countries weren't in good shape, right? We, we remember the Great Depression, for example, right? I mean, there was there was deflation and we had the Great Depression. People associate these two things with each other, um, and I think a lot has to do with this cliff that the economy could fall off on if the deflation becomes too large. So policymakers don't want to go, you know, some small degree of deflation is benign, but going beyond that is dangerous. Policymakers just don't want to go there. They'd rather have a little bit of inflation. That doesn't sound too bad. Let's get back to a little bit of inflation. So how do you do that? How do you, what, what can you do in Japan, for example? And in Japan, uh, you know, lots and lots of recipes have been, have been tried. None of them really, really work very well. So one idea, you know, you, again, you look to Milton Friedman, he says, you know, inflation is everywhere a monetary phenomenon. Let's just print money. Well, that doesn't really help because if money, you know, as you described so nicely in your slides, if money is an exact substitute for bonds, right, people just get rid of bonds, hold the money, and then at some later point, they will just swap it back. So the, the money will just, at, at, at the deflationary rate, will just be, you know, siphoned off by the population. They will just, you know, they will just hold it. And, and you really don't solve the problem at all. So Michael Woodford has proposed, and I think that's maybe one of the most interesting suggestions there, to commit yourself to return to a certain price path in the future. So that means that you, know, you, you may not be able as a central bank to do much about the deflationary path for now, because people are really indifferent between bonds and money, but you can promise that once you're back in the driver's seat, once you're back to influence what the inflation rate is, to get back to a price pass that you pre-announce, so that the longer the deflation lasts, the more inflation should you then subsequently have to come back to this price path. Now this, if this works, if you can convince people of this, and that's back to your managing the expectations uh, bit, right? If this works, this is, this is wonderful, because then, then people would say, oh, you know, it's not a good idea to put my money at the mattress, because you know, it's true I have deflation now, but if I keep it there too long, you know, inflation will pick up again, and I better start spending now, and the, and the deflationary goes, goes back into the, into the bottle, right? It, it, it's not foolproof, but among the many ideas of how you could stop the deflation, this may be one of the most interesting things. In fact, if you read the Wall Street Journal this morning, there was a little debate about Ben Benante talking about an idea of Mike Woodford. Mike Woodford admonishes the Fed to, co to commit itself to inflation. I think that's exactly the idea that he has in mind, and the Fed so far has ruled that out. I think it would be a creative tool not to have inflation per se, because inflation is good, but to get back to the price path. So that's an interesting idea to get out, to get out of the deflation of trap. Let me mention one more thing, the expectations, which I think is absolutely crucial, let's say, in Europe. Right? We see lots of countries that embark on a path, you know, they, they, they talk about growth policies. So I don't know what people have in mind. It sounds to me like what they have in mind is Keynesian stimulus policies, where you spend a lot now and worry about debt and repaying taxes in the future. Well, in Europe, that strikes me as exactly the wrong recipe, because the problem in Europe is not that, you know, that the government hasn't been spending enough. The problem is that people are afraid that the government is not being, is, will not be able to repay the debt in the future. 
So if somehow you could assure markets in Europe that the government will repay the debt in the future, the genie would go back in the bottle and the, and the, and the crisis in Europe would be over. So it's all about expectations there. And you know, it's, it's difficult to solve that problem, right? But Europe, much of it is an expectational game. How do you get, how do you get the expectations in line so that people go back to the normal business rather than worrying about the sovereign debt default? Do I get a couple words? Of course. So expectations matter. This is really the, the important lesson. It's, it's what we shouldn't call macroeconomics macroeconomics. We should call it intertemporal economics. It's about today versus the future. And, and what people think is going to happen in the future is what matters crucially. That was the revolution in, econo in macro in the 1970s that got us away from simple-minded Keynesianism. Uh, and, and so thinking about what do people expect and, and how do things affect people, what people expect is the important way to think. Now, let's answer the question. You said those horrible words, managing expectations. Uh, and, and let's th think about just the kinds of policies we're, we're talking about. You know, what's going on in Europe is throughout two years of, of an obvious solvency crisis, the, the European leaders have been taking this as a job of managing expectations. Oh, we need a big announcement to calm the markets and, and, to, br and to bring down their expectations. There's, as, as if you could manage them the way you try to you know, manage your, your five-year-old kids' expectations of desserts with promises. Uh, Woodford, you know, says, okay, what the Fed needs to do now is, is make a big announcement about how it's, going to, uh, how it's going to have a lot of inflation in the future. But, but wait a minute, we just talked about how the Fed is completely powerless, how treasury bills and money are exactly the same thing. So there's nothing the Fed can do today to affect anything. So what it's going to do is make a big announcement about how in the future it wants inflation to be high. Okay, if inflation isn't high, what are you going to do now? You're just as powerless in the future as you are now. Teddy Roosevelt sa said, uh, speak softly and carry a big stick. This is the advice to speak loudly because you have no stick. Well, well the markets are going to figure out you have no, no stick. So managing expectations by sort of making announcements about what we want, it's interesting because it kind of works in the models. In the model, the Fed says, OK, we want inflation to be 3%. Then everyone says, yes, sir, and inflation goes to 3%. But, but I wonder spend any time with, with real people, you know, so maybe the Fed is so credible and believable and so forth, but we've all seen deficit forecasts. When was the last time the government published a forecast of here's what the deficits are going to be for the next five years, and you did anything but, you know, use that paper to start your charcoal grill, right? We all know that's completely meaningless. Why should people believe Bernanke any, any more than they believe the Treasury? Well, and, and for good reasons. They shouldn't. Because Bernanke is right now deciding what he's going to do and then saying, now we're going to pre-commit for the next three years. Well, don't you think two years from now, when things are different, he's going to say, well, that was a nice pre-commitment, but now I've decided what I want to do is something different because the global debt crisis is breaking out. Everybody knows if Bernanke's able to make an announcement today and say, you know what, I've decided we're going to have higher inflation three years from now, and I want to pre-commit to that, Everybody knows that tomorrow he can wake up and change his mind to do something else. So there's no way to pre-commit yourself to something that you have the authority to change all the time. So economics has thought hard about this. How do you solve, how do you, how do you get stable policy in a case where expectations about the future matter so much? And the answer is you have to have rules, institutions, um, not discretion. Um, that's been something we've been searching for in monetary policy since the gold standard disappeared. The gold standard had lots of problems. I don't think we should go back to a gold standard, but it had one great advantage. It was a clear rule institution. It, it gave a pre-commitment. The dollar is going to be 32 ounces, $32 per ounce of gold done. We kind of know what it's going to be, and you're not going to be able to wake up tomorrow morning and say it's going to be something different. Now, Friedman's monetary rule, Taylor's interest rate rule, we're, we're trying hard to get back to that, but the, the answer to a, an economy where expectations matter so much is not that you shoot from the hip to try to manage expectations like we're a class of, uh, of kindergartners. The answer is you need to have policy that's based on rules, institutions, laws, not the whims of, of grand czars running things. And I think that's the second, the big lesson of modern macroeconomics. And I should just point out there's complete agreement here, right? So 
you know, I, I, I said, you know, if people believe this, but this if is, is that's a big, that's a very big if, right? And there's no it, reason it, for them to believe it. People are smart, right? You, you just can't go out and give a nice speech and, and, and imagine people believe it. It doesn't work like this, right? We are distrustful of politicians for good reasons, as John pointed out. So unless we put credible rules in place, you know, we, we don't even have a chance. And even if we try to put, you know, rules in place that look credible, Right, you know, they, they will be violated too. Right, so just as a reminder, right, when the European Monetary Union was formed, there was a Maastricht Treaty. All the governments agreed that they would stick to certain uh, fiscal targets and that the ECB would never, ever, in their, in, you know, in the, in the wildest dreams, would they ever dream about, you know, buying government bonds or helping help, helping governments uh, finance. Uh, you know, finance unsustainable debt levels, right? And guess what we have seen, right? And now Merkel is proposing new fiscal rules, right? The moment she proposed them, everybody said, that's fine. Then Spen said, yeah, we agree too, but by the way, this year we are breaking them already, right? And, <laughs> you know, they didn't even wait until the ink was dry on their paper. So it's super hard. So managing expectations means you really have to put up, you really have to deliver, you really have to do things so that people have good reasons to believe that the things that you're promising will come to pass. And unless you do that, you know, you, that, you, you just can't. I mean, that's, that's, that's the bottom line. But the, the answer is policy, where we're all used to think about policy, is what should we do now? And, and sort of Chicago types have no influence on policy because we always answer that with, well, here's what the rule should be. And they, and they don't want to know what the rule should be. So, OK, that's fine. But what should we do now? Well, <laughs> if you have the uh, option to say, what should we do now, then there's no way you can ever pre-commit yourself and, and have any statements that make any sense about the future. Um, just one follow up on this. Uh, I think, um, John, you uh, wrote in an article a suggestion that the Fed would target CPI futures. Um, maybe we, you can just discuss that and also the idea perhaps that, uh, you know, we used to have a gold standard, but, but perhaps we could go to something where the Fed backs its liabilities, uh, money, with something more real. And that real could be something like inflation index debt or something. Uh, would, would that perhaps be an idea? Yeah, so this is not. Uh I, I prefer to have all the equations spelled out somewhere, so this is an idea we've been talking about. As I think about what I'd, the ideal monetary policy I'd like to see is a price level target. So the CPI is gonna, I don't know what it is today, but 130, it's gonna be 130 for now and, and forever. Sort of in the, old, in the old way, there was a gold standard target that the, the dollar was worth so much gold. Well, we can't do that for all sorts of reasons I don't wanna talk about. But we certainly could have a similar commitment that the price level is always going to be the same. There won't be any inflation. There won't be any deflation. And then the second question is, where's the stick? How do you, how do you enforce that? What action can you take? And yes, I, I think the um, Fed could. Um, you, what you need to have is, is something nominal, a dollar, and something real. So a, as gold was something real, and you always commit that a dollar is worth so much gold, other proposals have been a dollar's worth so much wheat. We, we, the thing real that we have in our financial system is CPI futures or inflation index debt. So by always targeting the relative prices of those two, I think you could have not only the main thing, which is to have a price level target, but second, to have a commitment device, a rule for policy that, that always means you're going to nail that price level target. OK. Um, great. Uh, we're not going anywhere with that anytime soon. No. <laughs> um, uh, I'm just going to Okay. Um, I'd like to get back to what uh, the Vice President um, was saying there. Uh, he seemed to suggest that it's a counter counterintuitive idea that you should spend more um, in an economic downturn. And my impression is that many people think it's actually quite intuitive that the government should, should spend more or at least do something when, uh, when there's an economic downturn. Um, and this something often seems to boil down to government deciding to a much, much larger extent what uh, goods and services should be produced and consumed. The question, I guess, is do collective problems necessarily require collective solutions? Um, and then could you give us some of the best arguments for and against, let's say, increased spending, which is also called fiscal stimulus? Um, I guess it's Harold's turn. turn. Yeah, so. <laughs> You know, what a government, I mean, fiscal policy is, you know, actually, it's, it's complicated. So, so it's, it's, you know, it's, it's good to do certain things, not to do, to do other things. And sort of this broad brush that in a recession we always have to spend, in a boom we should always retract. You know, it's, it's probably 
two core statements. So let me, you know, you ask for, and that's why you ask for, you know, possible pros and cons. So let me give, let me give you a pro argument, right? Let's say you want to build, you always want to build, you know, you, you walk around Chicago. I, sometimes when I'm under these bridges, right, I'm, I'm afraid that they will fall down, right? And there's certain roads that have so many potholes that my car, you know, always is close to breakdown. You just hope that they get fixed at some point. When is a good time to fix them? Well, it's a, a good time to fix them is presumably when, when, when labor that, uh, you know, when, when wages are, are, are low in the, in the construction industry, when there are lots of people idle out there that could do construction, when you don't have to compete against private business to do that construction. You know, it, it doesn't matter much when you fix the streets, whether you fix the streets in a boom or in a recession, so you might as well fix them in a recession. There's another argument that uh, where, where government spending is, uh, uh, you know, and that's cyclical, and that's the, that's the uh, that's automatic stabilizers, right? So when we provide people with unemployment insurance and so forth, you know, people want to be insured against business cycle risk. You know, people that have low-paying jobs that can't go out and, and buy fancy financial contracts, right? They, they may be particularly exposed to business cycle risk. So, you know. Developing institutions that insure them against business cycle risk by having some form of unemployment insurance, I think to me sounds sensible. So there, you know, government spending automatically goes up via these automatic stabilizers, and you know that's a good thing. But it's a bad thing, for example, if you're in a fiscal crisis, as we currently see in many countries in Europe, to go out there and try to spend yourself out of the fiscal crisis. Right? I mean, the the nice uh, quote from Biden that that you showed illustrated that very nicely. Right? I mean. Spain is broke, right? So the idea that Spain could somehow rescue itself by even spending more, you know, is, 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 is absurd to begin with, right? Um, fiscal stimulus in a recession, as we have seen in 2009, also didn't work because the lessons that we have learned over the last 40 years applied again. You know, the spending comes too late, it, it's often devoted to the wrong projects, and so forth. At the end of the day, you know, it, it does extremely little. So the typical Keynesian arguments that have been given for fiscal stimulus, they have been, they have been debunked many, many times. You, know, you may be getting you know, a slight uh, fire, you know, maybe, maybe that looks good for, for a short period, but you're going to be you know, having to worry about the resulting debt problems and tax problems down the road, so. I'm sure John has. Uh, yeah, a, a couple, uh, I mean, I'm sort of just gonna cheer Harold a little bit um, and say the same thing in different words. Um, there's, there's this, yeah, should we do something? I, I, I object to that language. An economy like sort of a, a human patient, if it's in trouble, you might want to you know, fix the problem. And so number one might be let's diagnose the problem and fix it. The stimulus thing, has a, the, the, all of Keynesianomics has, has a remarkable one-dimensional view of economic prosperity and, and decline. Now it's all about spending. It's too much spending or too little spending, that's it. It's sort of like, no matter, no matter how much, what you're sick with, it's you know, Uncle Bob's magic elixir, which is gonna fix you. And you know, you got the gout, we'll give you more of it. And you got something else, just you know, the magic tonic of spending. It's not how economies are. You know, we had a recession because we had a financial crisis. And a lot of things that the, the bailouts I didn't like so much, but a lot of things the Fed did to address the financial crisis affected the financial problems. If you, if you just become, oh, it's just too much spending, that seems like kind of silly. Similarly, Greece has problems. So, so Greece's economy is going down the toilet. Is that really because its government isn't spending enough? That, that, you know, we know lots of other things that are wrong. You know, Greece's economy, Detroit's economy is in, in terrible shape. Is Detroit's big problem that its exchange rate is too high or is its big problem located in lots of other places? You know, Greece, we know, it's full of these structural problems. The whole economy is, is the sand in the gears and, and just sort of pouring more gas down. It doesn't address the problem at all. But let's talk about stimulus itself. Um, like Harold, I want to clarify what the question it is. The proposition is not that in recessions, governments should not run deficits. Of course they should run deficits in recessions. For the same reason that you know, if, if you lose your great jobs at Morningstar, that doesn't mean you should stop eating. Uh, you, know, you dip into your savings for a while and, and go you know, try to look for another job. And governments are the same way. The incomes are volatile, the spending, we can debate if the level's right or not, but given the level, it should be fairly constant. That means you're running uh, deficits and recessions. And as Harold mentioned, recessions could be great places to do positive value projects because the construction workers come cheap and so forth. 
The issue for fiscal stimulus is whether above and beyond all that, does the go if the government borrows a dollar and spends it, does that make the economy one and a half dollars better off? No matter whether that spending is useful or not. So forget about roads and bridges. It, it, in Keynesian economics, if the government borrows a dollar and spends it on, uh, on something that ends up on the bottom of the ocean, totally useless spending is fine because that raises GDP more than a dollar and a half. Is that proposition true? And that's where I think what we're saying, no, that one isn't true. And the answer is quite simply because there's a budget constraint. That money has to come from somewhere. That is, that is not manna from heaven. If the government borrows a dollar from you and spends it, that's a dollar you do not spend. And it just doesn't work to raise GDP. Now let me be a little bit of a heretic. In some sense, fiscal stimulus can work. Yes, you heard it here. How? We were talking about Japan and Japan's problems with, with why it is that, that, that showering money from helicopters seem not to increase demand in Japan. Well, because money was, the way they did it, money was government debt, and everyone said, fine, you're increasing your government debt, that means you're gonna pay it back in the future, so, so it has no effect. The way to have monetary policy create inflation is you have to persuade people that you're not gonna pay back the debts in the future. So, Keynesian stimulus is about borrowing money and you are going to pay it back in the future. That's supposed to have an effect. The way you have an effect is by borrowing money and making it clear you're not going to pay it back in the future so that people get rid of this money like a hot potato. Now, it does create inflation, and I'm not saying creating inflation is good, but if you want to create inflation, you have to do it by fiscal stimulus. And the tough part is convincing people that you're absolutely going to be irresponsible and never pay this back. So fiscal stimulus could work in the sense of creating inflation. In fact, the fiscal theory of the price level says if you want to create inflation, you have to do it by fiscal stimulus. It's just awfully tough to do. I guess also um, there's this idea that if you increase, if you, if you increase the debt level, if, you, if, the, if the citizens owe it to themselves, there's no problem, right? We, we, we owe debt to ourselves, so there's no issue. I guess one problem with that, um, Oh, what are the problems with that? I can think of one maybe is that you have to raise taxes. The other thing is that whatever activity was um, stimulated by that uh, spending, that could, activity could have been something else. So the question becomes, who is directing economic activity? Mm. Is it the government or is it an individual? Um, anything, any comments on that or just pure agreement? <laughs> No, I think we're, pro you know, I mean, there's, there's we need, we need more on this one, there's probably, <laughs> right, there's probably too much agreement here, you know, you, you, you just, you know, I mean, it's, 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 it's for John Paul, right, I mean, you have to find out what is it that, uh, you know, what is it, is there a reason that private markets can't do something where the government has to step in and, and do something, and, um, you know, even among ourselves, we often fall into this trap, so, so one of my, so I just have to give you the story, so one of my teachers in Minnesota was Ed Prescott, and uh, at Prescott, admonished students often of writing a chicken paper. And, he, and I, I think it shows these words on purpose. So, so you, everybody can write a chicken paper, and I'll tell you what it is. So it has three assumptions. It says, assumption one, private agents, agents, you know, households, consumers like to eat chicken. All right. Assumption two, private markets can't produce chicken. Assumption three, government can produce chicken. And then you reach the magical conclusion that government should produce chicken. And if you, if you think many, about many of the policy proposals out there, you realize that it's, 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 it's that line of argument. Right? We should, often we can trust private markets to, uh, to accomplish things pretty well. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's tough, right? Because you let these people out there, I mean, you wake up in the morning and you, and you want to buy yourself milk from your local grocery store. It's magic that the grocer out there put the milk on the shelves for you to buy. I mean, think about that. It's a bit of a miracle, right? You've got to trust, you've got to trust the shop that it does that from a profit maximization motive to have the milk there you know, once you try to buy this. You don't need a government telling that guy, you know, put the milk there because Edith Magnus here is going to buy milk tomorrow. You see what I mean? Now, there are instances, of course, in which it's good to have the government uh, you know, step up to the plate. Sometimes it's the, gov it's, it's the government invention in the first place that, that, that created the mess, right? And so when we had the financial crisis in 2008, there was a big mess. Was that induced by government policy? Was that induced by you know, players you know, getting way out of line? I mean, who knows? 
but you know, it, 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 maybe there was a point where some intervention of some form was, was, was necessary and where the private markets by themselves couldn't resolve the matter. So these, these matters do happen, right? But we have to be very, very careful about these kinds of arguments. I think, though, so there's a big question of what activities does the government have to do, and there are plenty of them, and what activities should the private sector do? We had a re recent little blog war about, about should the government be borrowing now at low interest rates to invest, and where can it invest at positive rate of return, and why haven't markets done that? And that that's a good argument, sort of the, that's sort of the argument of our time, the proper scope of, of government. But it, I think it's, let's not confuse it with the stimulus question, because the Keynesian stimulus proposition says, if you borrow money and spend it, that's good, and it does not matter if the thing you spent it on was valuable. Even if, as Keynes said, pay people to dig ditches and, and fill them back up again. That's good for GDP. Well, so whether it was a good project or not, it's sort of in the salesmanship they kept saying, oh, it was important that it's a good project and we'll invest in windmills and it'll be just wonderful. But from Keynesian economics, that's irrelevant. So we shouldn't go down that argument for discussing stimulus. That's kind of like uh, this columnist at the New York Times after 9-11 said that the destruction would help create jobs. And I forget his name. I think it was Krugman. Um, yeah. it, it does uh, create oh, jobs, right? It does it's, create jobs. You know, but it no, doesn't no, create, it doesn't create that's right. And that every time, every, that, uh, but every it's time, not, not good, right, to create jobs. Every time Hitler sunk a liberty ship, he did us a favor, because then we got to build another one, and that gave us a dollar and a half of GDP. Yeah. Right. There's another version of this argument, and you know, you, you even meet colleagues that are kind of confused by that. They, so in the European debt crisis, they say, well, one reason that Germany should help Greece is because all these Greeks were buying all these German cars, right? And so the moment the Greeks stop buying these German cars, there will be unemployment in Germany. And you, then you have, to painfully, you have to painstakingly point out to these people that you know, if all that you're doing is produce cars and then give them away, you know, that's not going to do any good to you, right? <laughs> I mean, I'd either much rather you know, be on the beach and enjoy the sunshine or you know, keep the car for myself. But giving cars away for free, you know, it's, I mean, it creates jobs, right? But mm -hmm. it, doesn't, it doesn't do you any good. So. so Europe has come up a couple of times. I'd like to spend the uh, last, uh, I think we have 10 minutes left talking about what's going on there. Um, that would basically be my first question. What is going on in, in Europe? How did we get to this point? Uh, was the euro a good idea or is it eventually doomed to fail? Um, if we think about the euro and, and its fiscal backing, is that possible when you have uh, so many countries that supposedly have to back it fiscally? There are no real assets backing the euro after all. Um, and is maybe this one of the reasons why, why leaders are so hesitant to let individual states default or abandon the euro, um, because it undermines its, the euro's fiscal backing. Boy, you asked a lot of questions. Uh, yeah, um, I don't I remember whose turn it was, but you can. Uh, I'll start briefly, and I, I'm sure okay. we'll, I'll try to be quick, and then we, because then yep. we'll do. Um, what's going on in Europe? I, I would say a massive uh, uh, collective self-delusion <laughs> is, is going on in Europe, um, uh, that, 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 that this is just going to pass. Um, the euro, I think, is great. I was a big euro fan. Uh, I, I think it's a wonderful idea. Uh, I like a common currency because I don't like inflation, and I like, I like removing that from the list of, uh, in, um, of, of stimulus uh, topics. I think it's especially good for a small country like Greece to pre-commit yourself against uh, devaluing ex post. Greece was, back when Greece had the drachma, remember, it was not the wonder of growth and prosperity. It, it was a country of perpetual inflation, devaluation, poor finances. Um, it started growing when it joined the euro, and, and probably, largely because, in my view, it pre-committed. Here's that pre-committed rules and institutions again. Pre-committed, look, we're issuing debt, but we're not going to be able to just inflate it away this time. It's going to be a really painful sovereign debt crisis with default and God knows what. If, and that's, you know, it turned out that's exactly where it's in. So the euro would be a great uh, common currency with the understanding that sovereigns default. That if you get in trouble, you default. Um, it could be, it, uh, you can also have a currency union with a fiscal union, with the understanding that, there's, that that currency is backed by all of our taxes. That's what we have in the US, because we pay federal income taxes, which is what fundamentally what borrows our, our bar, backs up our currency. So I was a big fan of Europe as currency union with the understanding of sovereign default, which is how the treaty was written. 
And then faced with it, the Europeans didn't want to do it. I think they're going to have to figure out that's their only way out. Uh, currency union with sovereign. The idea of a fiscal union in, in Europe is, is not going to happen. They're heading in the direction of basically monetizing the debt. The ECB has either bought most, so much of it or lent to banks, which in turn have bought so much of it. Europeans don't want to ever see any bank fail. So really, you're going to default on it, Germany's going to pay for it, or you're going to inflate it away. Uh, those are the three current policy choices. I think the, the only sensible one is, is sovereign default, keep the currency union. Uh, they may try some of the other ones. Leaving the euro will be a disaster for Greece. It, it will be a country the size of Chicago with capital controls cut off from the world. The right answer, of course, is the fourth possibility. Uh, the, the sort of the, 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 the reprogram the simulator as, as Captain Kirk did, which is start growing. Structural deform tomorrow morning, grow like crazy, your tax revenues will grow, bond markets will fund it, you could pay off this debt. No one wants to even talk about that one. They, they sort of uh, will start talking about sovereign default in a currency union, which is the only way out. Unfortunately, the muddle through option seems to be a hope for Germany to pay it off. Germany's not going to pay it off, so we'll inflate away the euro and then break it apart, which will be really sad. So monetizing the debt, I, you know, would, would Angela Merkel go along with that? <laughs> Given that Germany's what are the choices? <clears throat> we have an advisor of the Bundesbank with us. So. Well, I advise. I mean, I, I, I mean, they, they don't listen to me, but I try to advise them as much as possible. So it's, um, well, the you know, there's Germany gets you know gets so much criticism these days. When has to, I mean, first of all, the the, the euro, um, and I mean, like the euro too. I agree with John, but but the euro has been you know political construction, right? The euro was created in the wake of German unification. Germany became too strong in the middle of Europe, so the, the you know, France and other countries said, well, look, you know, you can't be such a large country and essentially run, run uh, European monetary policy through the Bundesbank. You have to give that up. The Bundesbank has to become a European central bank, right? And then, you know, that, that was agreed to. And in, initially, <clears throat> the idea was to make it very much like the French central bank at the time, under the control of some European level, uh, you know, maybe ECOFIN or whatever. And gradually, you know, that, that was shipped away because Germans were very, very opposed to this. So, so just as a background, there was, there was a hyperinflation twice in Germany over the, last, uh, over the last century. And so when you are in elementary school, you know, you learn three things. You learn how to multiply up to 10 by 10. You learn the alphabet. And you learn that a central bank should never, ever inflate away, you know, fiscal debt. I mean, it's just, you know, it's just, it gets, it gets ingrained. You, you, you believe that when you're growing up, right? I mean, you know, five times five is 25, and that's also a rule that you should stick to, right? So it's just shocking, the idea that, that once again, there's a central bank in Europe, or a central bank, you know, near Germany, right, that uses the printing press to, to print money to, uh, to, to inflate away the debt is, is just absolutely horrifying in Germany. And it's just not going to be supported. I think before that happens, Germany will exit uh, the, the, the Eurozone. That will be, you know, that will be difficult for, for Germany as well, but it will be, that will be the end. So would, that's, why, that's what Draghi, of course, that's what the ECB realizes, right? They realize they, they, can, they can only go so far before the music stops entirely. And that's why many of the ideas that are, that are, that are out there just mm -hmm. politically wouldn't be viable. Um, the debate has been very confused in, in Europe. When the, when the Greek sovereign problems happened, um, the politicians in Europe ran, were running around scared. They were saying, you know, this is going to be Lehman II, this is going to be Lehman II, this will lead to another worldwide financial crisis. And, you know, I was, I was thinking, you know, you know, how, right? I mean, Greece, Greek debt amounts to 4% of EU, you know, sovereign debt levels, right? It's not, you know, it's on a world scale, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's important for Greece, but on a world scale, it's small potatoes, it really is, right? I mean, if the stock market goes down by 4% in value, that wouldn't even, that would, that would be sort of reported, you know, on page 25 in the Wall Street Journal, you see what I mean? But if some of Greek defaults, that's, that's a big issue. It's just, it's just hard to understand. Now, many of these contracts were leveraged and so forth, the so politicians didn't know what they were getting into, but I fear that we have gotten ourselves in a debate, uh, that we have gotten the debate in Europe to a point where we mingle all these things together, sovereign default, banking crisis, the, 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 the euro, 
where we tie all these things together, we should untie them and we should deal with one problem at a time. We can have sovereign defaults, I very much agree with John Cochrane. We have to think about how to stabilize the banking system. One hint here, you don't stabilize the Spanish banking system by encouraging Spanish banks to hold Spanish bonds. Right? But that's exactly the policy that we started in December 2012. And, and you have to safeguard the euro as a stable currency. If it's a stable currency, it's going to continue to be used. and might as well be used in, in, in Greece. They don't have to exit. They can still use the euro. That's not, that's not the issue at all. I think I detected this minor point of disagreement about monetization or not. But <laughs> um, John, did you well, want to I, um, well, I think Harold said, faced with it, they'll leave. I mean, this is an accounting. What are the choices? Germany could pay off all the Spanish, Italian, Portuguese, and Greek debt. Not happening. I mean, Germany doesn't have the money to do it. Germany's got its own you know, sneaking little debt problems and government spending problems. So that, that option, it's just too big for, for that to happen. Um, we can inflate it away, or we, we can let the countries default. Now, that, that would have been easier earlier. The, those of you who trust bank regulators to be on the lookout for dangers and stuff like that, three years going now, and they're still treating sovereign debt as risk-free in, in banks. They're only beginning to wake up that this isn't such a good idea. And the local regulators have been really pushing the banks to buy up the sovereign debt to solve the sovereign debt crisis. So, now all that stuff is in the banking system. So when the sovereigns default, it's not just wealthy investors who lose money. You blow up the local banking systems. Uh, it's not the end of the world. You can, you can have new banks can come in, but that certainly makes the crisis much worse. So you know what's Germany's options? Uh, they can't pay it off. They don't seem to will and be willing to let it default, uh, and they they don't want the ECB to inflate. Um, it, it's just. Well, the ECB has been, um, you know, the ECB is, is really caught between a rock and a hard place. And what we have seen, for example, in, in the Greek default, and in, at the end of the day, I don't think it was good policy at all. The, the ECB insisted in the, in the debt restructuring of Greece that they don't lose money on their Greek positions. I mean, initially they insisted on being paid off in full. Eventually, it came down to saying, "Okay, at least give us back what we uh, uh, give us back what we originally paid for, because we already paid less than than the, than the sort of you know low interest rate value for these bonds." So, so the, so the ECB insisted on this, and so all the you know all the private debt holders were were stuck with the losses, right? Places like the Norwegian Wealth Fund, you know, the Chinese Wealth Fund, and so forth. And so now we are surprised that the Chinese Wealth Fund says, "Oh, you know." You know, we, we better don't buy that stuff anymore because we know that at the end of the day, you're going to be the one stuck with the losses, and that's not the place we want to be in, right? We demand much higher risk premium for us to be willing to hold that debt. So, but so far, the ECB has painstakingly tried to avoid these losses. Now, it is true, though, that the ECB has a huge, um, you know, that, 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 that they have a huge account there. That, you know, it's, it runs under the target two liabilities, and there's been a, quite a bit of discussion in Europe on this. You know, so maybe they've lent about two trillion. I mean, these are sort of the kind of numbers that float about by various means to the southern European banks, to the southern European governments, and so forth. Right. So should this all go belly up? Right. Two trillion is a lot of money. I agree with you. But two trillion is still, you know, it's you could repay that. Right. So if Germany and France and the northern countries in Europe got together and said, okay, fine, two trillion, who, you know, let's let's go and repay this. I bet you, if you asked in Germany, would you rather, you know, we know the two trillion are coming, right? There are two choices for you Germans. We can either inflate this away, or we can, over the years, pay this back. They would be, they would be mad, right? I mean, that's that, no question. I mean, imagine you had to pay two trillion. You wouldn't be happy, right? But if given the choice, they would rather repay than inflate it away. And but I think that's, that's what it boils down to. The two trillion pays off the amount that the ECB has now invested then, in. So, right. But we haven't gotten to the Italian and Spanish debt crisis yet. Germany cannot afford to pay off the entire national debt of Germany and Spain. That's just not no, happening. No, no, but, it, but it, does include, it does include loans by the ECB to the, to the Spanish and the Italian banking system. But I agree with you. They're, they're in the process of doubling up, right? They're, 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 they're putting more and more money in there, right? And, and it's, it, it, they have to come clean, right? And they're having the problem that, that right now there's a bank jog. I mean, there's, you know, you know, people are starting to withdraw their, their accounts. 
in, in, in Spain, where it's not, not clear that the Spanish banking system will survive, and so the, the ECB is trying to go in there and giving them emergency loans and saying, no, no, don't worry about it, right? But the, 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 it's not the job for the ECB to bail out insolvent banks in Spain. It, it just simply isn't, right? And so the ECB, at, at, at some point, policy makes in Europe have to come clean and, and find a good solution. But, but, so this, let's, um, situation. there is a hard question here, and, and we make it sound so easy. <laughs> I think, you know, a central banker's job is to provide liquidity and to notice problems where the market is illiquid and step in. And that's how they viewed this all along. There isn't a fundamental problem. It's just, oh, the markets are a little irrational today. Uh, they don't want to roll over the debt. We'll just help by buying some of the debt. Then the markets will calm down and we'll be able to sell the debt back again and everything will be okay. Liquidity crisis. Well, a liquidity crisis on and on. And that's, I think, how the ECB is seeing the Spanish. Oh, there's a run on the Spanish banks. Well, run means liquidity crisis. You know, you just read your run textbook. What do you do in a run? You're supposed to provide lots of liquidity. Then the run will ease, and then the central bank can get out. Well, telling liquidity from solvency is actually a lot harder than we make it sound. I think Harold and I are on the view that this was a solvency crisis two years ago, and, and that Europe's going to have to wake up. As I, I was listening to sort of market reports this morning and, uh, as I was getting ready, and it's still, oh, we need to see something big from the Germans, some big sign, some firewall, some emergency fund, some temporary funding to get us through the crisis. No, guys, sorry. Uh, I, I think our view is we left that world uh, two years ago, and the Europeans had better wake up and figure out that that is not the problem anymore.